Well, hello, everyone. I want to welcome you from wherever you might be around the world. We've got many countries joining us to this unique learning webinar. Of course, we hope that everyone is safe and healthy at what is obviously a very challenging time for humanity. I read this morning that globally, the coronavirus cases have now passed 1 million. So obviously a very challenging time for us. Before I introduce the presenters this morning, where I am, or this afternoon or this evening where you may be, let me introduce myself. I'm the moderator, I'm Ryan Johnson. I lead the executive and professional education team at Arizona State University's School of Sustainability here in Tempe. We are in the Sun Belt Southwest of the United States on a gorgeous cloudless day here. In addition to our faculty who will be presenting today, I'm joined by two ASU colleagues who I'd like to point out, Leslie Kepler and Ryan Moores, who are on hand to ensure that this presentation goes smoothly. So if you experience any issues, they will likely be the ones working to resolve it and feel free to chat directly to them, Leslie Kepler or Ryan Moores. This webinar is being broadcast from Arizona, as I said, but it's being conducted under the USAID's cleverly named Did You Know webinar series because it's based on work performed for the USAID RTAC program. In its long form, RTAC is Research Technical Assistance Center. And ASU is a proud university participant in RTAC, which is being led by the NORC team at the University of Chicago. Currently in year two, the RTAC is a global network of university researchers designed to provide USAID with rapid on-demand expertise across many sectors and geographic areas. And this webinar follows on the work of two in-person day-long trainings conducted in 2019 for RTAC with USAID staff in Washington, DC. So we're happy to be building upon a body of work here. A couple of comments just to set the stage before I hand it over to the presenters. First of all, the chat box is available and I see many people using it. Uh, it's in the bottom of the webinar navigation if you need it. You can either post a question, a comment, a worry, a concern for the entire room to see, or if you'd like some privacy or anonymity for some reason, feel free to write a question privately to me or to Ryan Moores, my colleague. We'll be behind the scenes monitoring, as I said. A note about questions. We're going to let the presenters move through their content and tackle questions at the end. Really appreciate those of you who responded in advance to the question request that we issued, uh, I think it was Friday. Um, you'll also note that we'll be doing some polling along the way. So we respectfully ask that you please participate in those polls if you can. People often wanna know about the availability of slides. So let me head that question off here at the very beginning by saying that the slides will be made available on the RTAC website after the webinar, as will a recording of this entire webinar. Evaluation, of course, one of the best ways to improve is to receive feedback and to evaluate. So at the conclusion of this webinar, you will see a very short evaluation questionnaire. And we would of course be very appreciative if you would take a minute or two to complete it. And just one final note here, a bit of a disclaimer. In the context of this unique moment that we find ourselves in, uh, this webinar about digital education has been planned for many months and the field work by these two faculty members has been conducted over many years. The COVID-19 situation is obviously front of mind for many people. It seems to be dominating most conversations, at least where I am these days. But this webinar is not specifically about COVID-19. Certainly there will be some lessons to be applied to the pandemic, but it is not a central emphasis of the presentation. So now let me hand this over to professors Mary Jane Parmentier and Fahim Hussein from ASU to take us through some evidence from the field about digital strategies for education, and I will rejoin at the conclusion. Take it away. Thank you, Ryan, and hello, everybody. Very exciting to see people from all over the world, um, especially during this time when we're probably um, in our houses at our computers trying to keep work going. Um, so really wonderful to connect with all of you. My name is Mary Jane Parmentier, um, and I'm a, a professor at ASU. I've been at ASU for actually be 20 years this May. Um, I've been teaching online since 2003 in some form or another, um, and I continue to learn. And I know many of you out there um, have a lot of expertise as well. 
Um, it's a continuing um, learning situation, um, teaching online at the undergraduate and graduate level um, in higher education. Um, I've taught both. I've taught small classes and larger classes, but I have to say the recent pandemic and moving online has created a new challenge for me, which is um, teaching synchronously. I'm more used to the asynchronous um, uh, learning management systems. And so um, I just want to say, you know, in that, that the sort of the, um, the spirit of we're all learning together here. Um, I'm the chair of a master's program, um, which I've designed actually um, with some colleagues about 20 years ago, and it's a master of science in global technology and development. So uh, my background is international development, and this is a master's degree where we, um, we teach students sort of the fundamentals of, of development um, theory, policy practices, and then the, the technology in there is, is we really put a critical lens on technology. We highlight that variable. How can technologies you know, improve um, people's livelihoods and how can we mitigate negative aspects? Um, currently, I've been um, actually looking into um, off-grid renewable energy um, systems with some colleagues of mine where we're looking to see how these systems can be community um, organized and managed and create more social value. And my work is mainly in Latin America, uh, most recently um, Bolivia, Ecuador, and Brazil, um, as well as Morocco. I lived in Morocco as a Peace Corps volunteer in the 1980s. Um, so I'll leave it at there and uh, introduce my colleague, Dr. Fahim Hussein. Thank you so much, Mary Jane. Thank you so much, Ryan and Leslie. Uh, two Ryans we have in the team. Uh, hi, everybody. Um, it's, it's been a pleasure. Uh, to be here and actually talk to some other people. Uh, we have been uh, confined in our homes uh, in the lockdown situation. So it's a, it's, it's a very unique uh, juncture, I think, in our life uh, that we are in. Um, so I am Fahim Hussein. I'm a professor in the School of uh, Future of Innovation in Society. And um, as a researcher, uh, my core focus area has been the use of technology, digital technologies for the betterment of people, uh, for the betterment of society uh, with the, through the lenses of justice, equity, empowerment. Um, and uh, I've been looking into the use of technology for women's empowerment. Um, and then also to look into for the last three years, I've been focusing on displacement issue, the refugees and how things can be used to make sure there are solutions for the people under duress, people on, on the move. Um, um, and uh, the things related with that. And I'm also interested in digital afterlife. So when this uh, uh, total uh, uh, crisis, the present crisis happened, we have been also reflecting on this, uh, as Ryan uh, Johnson mentioned, that we have been planning this for, for quite some time, but we see some similarities uh, and some challenges that we definitely can share with you and the experiences that we have uh, in the field. Um, and uh, as we go along, as we share our things. And I'm pretty sure that all of you have your own experiences. And that's why we would love to have your also your inputs uh, in, in the entire process. Um, so as a researcher and as a practitioner, I've been working in different continents, uh, in Sub-Saharan Africa, in South, Southeast uh, uh, and Central Asia, uh, and then of course in North America. So I'm, I'm looking forward to this opportunity to share our experiences with you. All right, hi everyone, it's Leslie. I'm gonna read the polls we have. So <clears throat> I'll launch that in just a moment. We'd like to ask you uh, what parts of the world you are joining us from. So here we go, here's the poll. <clears throat> Sorry, there we go. If you would be so kind as to answer. Great, we're at over half of you, almost two thirds. Super. All right, Whoop. a few more. All right, I'm gonna, I'm gonna go ahead and end it now. We've got almost three quarters of you who've answered and show you the results. All right, Mary Jane Fahim, you wanna say anything? Sure. Um, so it's interesting that it's, um, you know, in some ways sort of even um, 
in some ways. Of course, we have large designations. Asia covers a large span of the globe. But I also wanted to point out that the North Africa, 44%, I suspect that a lot of you are um, actually um, perhaps have lived or are from um, other regions as well. Yeah. Okay. Anything, Fahim? No, um, I'm just, um, no, it's, it's fascinating to see and the way it was moving from all over the world. I'm just excited to. I know, yeah. exactly. Okay. All right, great. So I'll close that out and you guys can continue. And just a note, if it doesn't close out on your own screen, you can just hit the X and close it out. That's right. Thank you. All right. <laughs> yeah. Here we go. Yeah, so the next slide, Leslie, please, um, where we're going to talk briefly about development. Um, so we're under the auspices here of the U.S. Agency for International Development. Um, we, I think, are all interested in education from um, the perspective of, you know, um, education as a human right, as well as education and how it contributes to, um, you know, national development, regional development, um, more global equality. And so I just want to make uh, just a few comments. We have entire courses that we teach on what is development. We actually make our students write long essays about it and they read a lot and they become more confused the more they read about it. Um, but I want to point out on the left side where you have um, the, the visual where it says progress, improvement, growth, advancement, forward. Um, you know, actually development is not linear, right? So while these are all values that we might agree um, are part of development, we also know that it's not linear, um, that things can improve and then they can go backwards. Um, you can have, you know, developed regions and then you can have them, um, you know, civil war can happen or um, a global pandemic. Um, there's many factors that can um, make development go, go backwards. Um, and at any given time, there's sort of positive and negative um, things that are happening in, in all societies. Also want to point out that we're talking about all elements um, of society, so social elements, economic, political, cultural. Um, and that we now know that uh, development is more than economic growth. Um, human development is the term that was coined by some scholars in the UN Development Program in the early 90s, um, and that's the approach that, that we take. Um, economic growth is a big part of it, but it's not enough, because as we know, you can have economic growth from foreign direct investment, from a myriad of factors that actually doesn't contribute to, um, to people's well-being. Um, next slide, please. So I just want to relate that briefly to um, the U.S. Um, AID's metrics in their strategy, uh, which has been called the journey to self-reliance that um, many of you might be quite familiar with. It's actually on the USAID website if you'd like to look, and that's what these metrics are directly from. Um, and it's broken into two interesting ways of sort of slicing this. Um, and again, behind this and at the end of this is this concept of development, right? Improving people's lives. So could the commitment part has to do with looking at government policies, looking at how government is set up, um, how government interacts um, with, with the economy, with, um, with society in a myriad of ways in terms of commitment um, to various development metrics and then capacity. Um, so, you know, tax administration, how well does, is a government able to actually collect taxes and then use those taxes to, to create um, benefits for the public good? Um, we're gonna highlight here um, education. If we go down um, under capacity, we can see education, and that's the, the topic of our, um, of our webinar today, which I think, you know, arguably we could say is the, um, maybe the most central metric of all as it connects with all of these others. And then following that, you can see economy, um, purchasing power parity is the PPP indicated here. And this again, this is from the USAID website. ICT usage, we're gonna have a note a little bit later on that. ICT referring to information communication technology, which is in fact um, the variable that we're um, taking a look at today. Uh, next slide, please. Yeah, so highlighting the education sector in particular. Um, as again, as, as probably most of you know, the Human Development Index in the UN Development Program was um, developed in order to, in a way, simplify and bring in key indicators to measure human development. So looking at um, health, longevity, education, um, and um, income, per capita income. But education is one of those three um, key indicators of um, human development. 
Um, and again, it touches upon, I would argue, all of the other sectors um, participating in the government, in the economy, um, uh, in terms of health. Um, and so then I, yeah, I would just raise the question, is it the most critical element to development and self-reliance? Just that you don't need to answer that, but something to think about. Um, yeah, and the next slide, okay, so um, one more thing about education, and then I'll turn it over to Fahim. Um, I also want to point out when we're talking, we're talking about technologies used to enhance education and to impart education, but there's also education about technology, which is very critical. And some of our examples will get into that. So, you know, you can have technology delivered to people, but if they don't, if they're not literate or they don't have the computer skills, um, they're not able to access that te technology. So it goes both ways. Um, so please, Fahim is the next here. Thank you so much, Mary Jane. Um, that, it's been fascinating. So when we talk about development and these multifaceted uh, uh, dimensions of development and technology does play a role um, in, uh, in many ways uh, to implement some of the ideas, key ideas of development. And when it comes to education, as Mary Jane rightly pointed out, uh, it, it can be used as a tool or a set of tools as a platform, but at the same time, uh, digital technologies itself is, is a topic uh, to be educated about to develop our human resources around it. So when we talk about digital technologies, when we talk about ICTs, which is information and communication technologies, well, what do we really mean? It's, a, it's actually um, a, a complex compound system of different platforms and different options. Uh, uh, primarily, it can be fixed or it can be wireless when it comes to networks, when it comes to infrastructure. Uh, it definitely has a big component when it comes to hardware. We're talking about, uh, for example, uh, one of the key um, IC, uh, digital technologies or ICT is our phone. We have that. Uh, and then phone is beyond just phone. We are talking about communication devices, uh, data access devices. These are all computing machines. And then we have tablets, tablets, so many other things. Uh, and at the same time, we have uh, the software interfaces, social media services are there, uh, different kind of software, uh, software interfaces we're looking into, different multimedia applications. And more importantly, also what we, we it's important for us to uh, focus on is the interfacing, the connection uh, with uh, the older uh, technologies. Um, these uh, quote unquote old media, such as uh, radios and the televisions or the landforms. And it's very crucial um, as we reflect on any kind of uh, crisis or we look into solutions for any uh, resource challenged uh, scenarios where we want to reach the last mile. Uh, it's, it's very important for us when we talk about technologies, when we talk about ICTs, we have this, uh, um, you know, a broader view. Uh, next slide, please. We have another poll, so I'll launch that in just a moment. Here are some options that you'll be answering about. We'd like to know what technologies you're currently using for education specifically in your country or region. So here comes the poll. <clears throat> and let me get to the right one. Hold on. Not working like I want. Here we go. Here we go. Sorry about that. All right, here we go. Um, so which technologies are in use in your area? About two thirds of you have replied. One more second or so. All right, I'm going to stop it there. Thank you for those of you who answered. Here are the results. And Leslie, this is Ryan. We did get a question 
Could you clarify what are fixed networks and what do you mean by old media? Okay. Right. I, I will address that. Okay. Um, yeah, so it's, it's, it's very interesting and not surprising at all when we're talking about uh, uh, the, the trend. What I was actually, frankly, hoping to see is uh, more uh, use of mobile phones or smartphones, but it's, it's very interesting to see um, that still the, uh, the computer, the tablets, the use of it, specifically in the education sector, it's, it's still there. When we talk about, and of course the fixed network is there, and then um, I'm, I'm very excited to see also the interface of the old media. So when we talk about fixed networks, we are talking about uh, infrastructure that connects us uh, through fiber to home, uh, to, through traditional copper networks or in between whatever we have, the fiber optics, um, that like the broadband or the narrowband in whatever ways the households or uh, the offices are being uh, connected through the central hubs uh, of uh, different countries' uh, digital infrastructure. So, and these are fixed. Now from fixed, when we talk about fixed, it can be wired or it can be also wireless. Uh, through microwave networks and other things, uh, mobile networks, uh, mobile communication, it can be actually established. Now, the other question I think was the interface with old media. And that's where we, we, we did clarify that it, we are talking about traditional radio, FMs, AMs, and also broadcasting TVs. All right, I'm going to stop sharing the results now. And Thank you. back to our presenters. <laughs> So um, as you are, rightly so, I think um, uh, as we move on to the, to the different slides, it's, it's very important us to uh, start thinking about what kind of digital technologies and systems are relevant for education uh, in uh, uh, your own country or region. Uh, as Mary Jane was talking about different types of development and different uh, sectors of development to look into, when it comes to education, it's also very important uh, for us to reflect on that the digital uh, solutions, digital technological solutions, or some sort of an interfaces which are relevant for one uh, situation may not be relevant for others. We need customized, localized, uh, and uh, uh, localized solutions uh, for, for the things and the challenges that we look into. Um, and we are definitely going to revisit this uh, when uh, the Q&A happens. Next slide, please. So in the coming slides, what we are talking about, what we're going to talk about is the different um, uh, facets of uh, digital technologies in education. Um, so let's start with the benefits. Uh, um, the obviously, the things that we look into, why do we use technologies? To, um, to ensure efficiency. Uh, and efficiency for whom? That's a very important question to uh, actually ask and to answer. Uh, it's, uh, there are different stakeholders um, in, uh, when we talk about um, education services, and it's very important for us to consider those uh, stakeholders, recognize those stakeholders, and have them in the conversation when we are designing some solutions. Because if we do it right, what we see is uh, that can definitely empower uh, just not the people who are providing it, but mainly the people who, is, who the education is for, the learners. Um, and uh, when we use the different uh, type of digital technologies, it's just not the fixed network. Imagine that we were talking about the infrastructure. Um, it's also about the type of content we are looking into, how we are designing the content so that it can, um, it can mesh between our traditional face-to-face -face conversations, and at the same time, it can transfer and translate to different digital platforms. And lately, what we are also seeing that not is just converting it to a digital format is not good enough. We also need to make sure that multiple digital form, digital formats are compatible with the content that we are making. So that's uh, and. These digital tools actually give us that opportunity to have that multi-dimensional uh, roles um, and natures and avatars of our uh, of our teaching content and our education content. And the one of the other fascinating things um, 
um, as we were talking about. And imagine I've been saying that for decades, uh, she has been uh, involved in online teaching. I also had the opportunity uh, heavily to be engaged in online teaching for different institutions and of course for Arizona State University. What we're seeing here is also this transcending geopolitical boundaries when we're talking about providing education and getting education using different technologies. Uh, our, a classic example of this is uh, this event as well, because uh, uh, as many of the events were shutting down and we were, we are being forced to be confined in our homes and offices. Uh, when we're we were thinking about this webinar, it, wa it was on time, it was on schedule because digital technologies actually helped us to make sure that we can go ahead with our uh, sharing of information, sharing of knowledge and sharing of our experiences. Um, so uh, the MOOCs is one of the other things we'll talk in uh, a bit in details later when we talk about massive online open courses. and. Um, more importantly, when we talk about digital technologies in education, uh, its opportunities and benefits, it's just not uh, the hardware infrastructure uh, or providing the content, it's also the management part of it, how we are allocating resources, how effectively we can do those. Uh, and in many uh, developing uh, communities, it's, it's very efficient to have uh, those uh, digital technologies used to make sure that we allocate our resources right. And it's beyond the traditional classrooms. It's just not the face-to-face -face thing. Learning can happen whenever, wherever, uh, in a 24-7 basis. So these are some fascinating opportunities, I think, when it comes to digital technologies in education. Um, so next slides. We have, I think we have a poll here. Yes, we do. We'd like to know from the group what opportunities or benefits that they have found in what they're already doing with educational initiatives in their area, in their work. And the choices are, as you see, empowering learners, transcending geopolitical boundaries, beyond the traditional classrooms, better education management, technology as effective tools, or because of what's going on now or other crisis times, uh, delivering it in times of crisis. So let me get you to the poll. Here we go. All right, so we'd like to know opportunities or benefits that you've already experienced in the work that you've done. I'll give it another second or two. We're at the halfway mark for our group. All right, last chance. Those of you who might not have answered yet. All right, I'm gonna close the poll. Thank you, everyone. And here's the results. Couldn't be better when we are talking about empowering, uh, empowering learners and also beyond uh, traditional classrooms. So this is, this is, yeah. um, uh, these are the things, these are the key things. That's exactly. Yeah, I was just thinking the same thing, Fahim, that it's not, you know, people are responding based on sort of the learning and the outcomes and the environment of education, not the technologies themselves. <clears throat> And that, that's very important. Uh, I just wanted to add this point, uh, add one point that I think I missed. When we talk about opportunities and benefits, one of the other uh, very fascinating things it does is uh, use of digital technologies also helps us to sometimes actually go over or address uh, uh, some of the, the social challenges uh, related with say, uh, women's participation or any kind of minorities participation or ensuring accessibility. Digital technologies can, act, if designed right, digital technologies definitely can help us to achieve those goals. And uh, I'm, I'm just, uh, yeah, too excited to see the post. We can, we can move on. Thank you. Leslie, can you broadcast the result of the poll? Some people haven't seen it. Yes, I thought I had done that. So let me go. I don't know, Ryan. Let me see if I can get to it now. <clears throat> Here we go. I'm going to share them again. The results were not shown. Several people in the chat box are saying they didn't see the results. Them. Hopefully. Yeah. 
So they are on the screen now for me. I don't know about for everyone. I haven't seen it. I'm not seeing it. You're not. Yeah, we, some people are saying no. Okay, so. I think we should move along because we're um, halfway through our time at this point. Yep. And right. then we can work on the technical um, part of sharing the, all the polls. Um, yeah, very quickly, the, the poll was uh, the majority of people talked about um, that uh, they have been uh, looking into the digital technologies opportunities from an empowering learner's point of view and also from a tran transcending geopolitical boundaries point of view. These are the winners from that. But of course, there are challenges. Um, there are uh, huge issues if uh, we don't uh, put it right. And as practitioners, uh, you, uh, you, you, you know better of what's happening in your, in your own region, in your own country. Uh, some of the things that we have seen in our field uh, of work, in our experience is if we don't design our content right, no matter how good our technology infrastructure is, we are going to be doomed. Uh, so that's very important. And in many cases, of course, the infrastructure itself is poor. Uh, we don't have enough resources. We don't have enough teachers, good teachers, good educators to begin with. So even with good infrastructure, even with good content, if we don't have the people to deliver it, uh, either online or offline, uh, then uh, there's no way of uh, uh, making it a success. And then, as I said during the poll, that um, uh, digital technologies, if used right, have the ability to uh, address some of the uh, vices of our society, some of the challenges of our society. Uh, and if uh, we don't do it right, then what happens is what, and we have seen it in research multiple times um, that the discriminations or the atrocities that happens against uh, uh, the minority groups or the people who do not have the agencies actually am amplifies online. So in, in, uh, when those are being taken from offline to online. Uh, and I've been working with uh, different groups uh, uh, in, under duress and we have seen that time and again. So risk is there. Privacy and security are huge risk when it comes to it. And when uh, we have with us uh, as participants, many policymakers and decision makers who are designing things, technological determinism is a huge thing when we look into it, meaning that we sometimes we get uh, fixated on certain technologies and we want to design everything. We, dis we consider those as silver bullets uh, and uh, this, can, this can solve everything. And those, uh, those trends and elements actually uh, changes over decades, changes over three, four, five years, that needs to be overcome. That we, we need to look beyond that. As you rightly pointed out about empowering learners, uh, transcending global boundaries, geopolitical boundaries, it can only happen when we look beyond uh, those technological, uh, shiny technologies and look and address uh, the, uh, the actual issues. I think we now have another poll, right, Leslie? Yes, we do. We'll make this one quick. I know that we want to be mindful of our time and I'm sorry that you couldn't see results. I do not know why that was. So let me, okay. And I need to get to the next one. Here we go. We're now interested in knowing about your challenges or risks. Here are the questions. Have you, is it a lack of infrastructure, policies, human resources, gender or minority inequity or inclusion? And you see the others, operations and maintenance or compromised privacy. So I hope everyone can see the poll. We'll see what happens when it's time to share it. I'll give it a few more seconds. So we're wondering what risks you have encountered. We're at about half of you answering. Leslie, sorry to interrupt. It's Ryan. Uh, it seems that this is a select all that apply question, but the question's only enabling one selection. So apologies oh. to those who are, yep. who are in the middle of it. Yes, sorry about that. So I guess it'll reflect the top concern though, which is right. Indeed. Right, Indeed. thank you. Infrastructure is winning, which is not a surprise. All right, I'm going to end it so we can move along and share you the results. Mm -hmm. 
Here we go. Yeah. So, so yeah. So lack yeah. of in infrastructure is forty three percent, and it's okay. it's the winner by a long shot. Again, not a surprise. Or it's making us the loser because of the challenges it makes. Mm -hmm. Yes, winner is sort of a misnomer, right? Right. <laughs> right. Yeah. All right. Are we ready to move along? Yes. Okay. Want to be mindful of the time. All right, here we go. We're now on to field evidence. Yeah, so in the next section, we're going to share um, some, some projects um, that we are familiar with. Um, and I'll begin with something that comes out of Arizona State University. And by the way, we're going to be talking about different um, aspects of education. So formal education, informal education. And this first example is actually, you know, access to information, which you know, the UN is considered it a human right. It's one of the main concerns with um, lack of connection to the internet for educators and for students, um, that if they don't have access to information, um, they, that, that's, a, that's a, a large factor in marginalization. Um, so the Solar Spell, which has been um, led, designed and, and led by one of our professors, Dr. Laura Haussmann, and at the end, there will be a resource slide, um, which you'll all have access to with the, the website for Solar Spell, as well as contact information in case um, you wanted to ask directly to the, to the, the leaders of this program. Um, so it's an offline digital library. And I actually have one here. I don't know how well you'll be able to show it, but I thought um, some show and tell we could try. So ruggedized, as in it's in a very, very hard, um, waterproof container. It's solar powered. There's a solar panel here. And it, inside, there's a Raspberry Pi where you insert. I've done this over the internet before. I'll show you what's inside uh, a Raspberry Pi, a battery. And what you do is you insert um, a chip that has your information. So this is curated. This has to be led by. Um, <clears throat> professionals by teachers um, and I can tell you <clears throat> a little bit about how that's done but there's a lot on the website um, to put the information that you want in here so local content um, it could be you know for primary school teachers in your in your district um, math skills it could be um, we've had governments that have wanted information on climate change on health um, issues it could be um, all sorts of things in, in whatever language you need it to be um, it mimics the online experience. So once you have your chip in there and there's information, people can get near it with a device. It can be an old um, smartphone, it can be an iPad, um, and you can find the hotspot and you can connect. You connect, it's, again, it's offline, you connect to what's there. Um, and it teaches internet ready skills that can be taught offline. So the idea is, is you know, there's a large number of people that don't have access to the internet. Um, but there's a hope that they will be and they need to be taught those skills so they're not left behind. Um, and again, um, relevant localized educational content um, done you know, with professionals. So we've been engaging um, um, teachers and librarians. And if we go to the next slide, we can see a map of the current locations. And again, this is from the Solar Spell um, website, which is really accessible to all of you. Um, the team has been working um, to a large extent through Peace Corps volunteers since they are in the field and they're working with teachers. Um, of course, right now there's been a recall of all Peace Corps volunteers, um, but it's still moving ahead. The project is actually moving ahead <clears throat> at Arizona State University with um, perhaps with some return Peace Corps volunteers and students at ASU to keep building content because obviously building content takes time as it's customized, but you can see the locations here. Um, next slide. Next slide has some images of, um, these are actually from the field. You can see under the East Africa picture, you can see the person in the middle, a teacher holding the, um, the solar spell, and you can see a, uh, an iPad to the, to the right, the pink device there where she's accessing the information. And then in the South Pacific, you can see a teacher who is doing the same thing and displaying the results on a screen so that all of her students can see it. Um, Yeah, so I think we'll move on from there. But again, um, this is just a quick snapshot of this really interesting project um, at ASU. Another project that I was involved in, um, and again, this resource is also in the, in the resource slide at the end, dreambuilder.org 
is actually the website. And this was designed by the Thunderbird School of International Management. Um, and it is an online free uh, tutorial for entrepreneurs, small scale on entrepreneurs. Um, and it's really targeted towards uh, women in Latin America in particular, and it's fully in Spanish and English. Um, and again, it's free. And um, it's, it's not just for women, um, men have used it as well. And you, you, you answer a series of questions about what your small business is, and it takes you all the way through from you know, designing to budgeting to marketing, and it gives you a blueprint for your business. Um, this was a training that we did in, in Quito, Ecuador, in a, a women's capacity building center. So these women did not have access to computers in their homes. Um, they came into the center um, to learn computer skills. And much of our workshop had to do with computer skills, actually, um, working through how you, how you log on, um, how you manage your way through this sort of tutorial. As you can see, there's some older devices in the background. Um, but this is an example of informal education that can be extremely important. Um, these are women that would not have access to computer, um, computer skill building, um, let alone an uh, entrepreneurship program. So the next slide, I believe we're going to be, I'm going to be handing it to you, Fahim. Yes, so handing it to Fahim for other parts of the world. Thank you. Exciting example. So I'll be quick with, uh, um, it's always tough to follow after solar spell, uh, but uh, we will we'll quickly go through the, we talked about informal education. Uh, now quickly, uh, the examples of formal education and how digital technologies can be used or have been used. So when we talk about uh, integrating any kind of, uh, uh, in, for the longer term uh, in, and in a larger scale, digital technologies uh, in, in different countries, it's very important to have a uh, to be in sync with the national policies. So for example, in Bangladesh, you have a digital uh, Bangladesh policy strategy for, for, for the last uh, 10, 12 years. And that really helped them to kind of integrate education, uh, like digital technologies for education, both from a content point of view and also from a the delivery service and uh, tech, uh, resource management point of view. And uh, they have been focusing on the content development and definitely a big focus was also, also always on the equitable access of education using uh, a better infrastructure. So that's something you can always uh, search for Digital Bangladesh and you can see some of the initiatives there. Next slides. Now, when we talk about uh, formal education, again in Bangladesh, it's just not the government. Sometimes what we have seen is the different NGOs, different uh, community-based organizations, and they can also provide uh, amazing um, uh, initiatives. Uh, so this Jago Foundation, they started offering um, education, high standard education uh, for the underprivileged kids uh, in different parts uh, of the country, uh, research challenge, can, uh, uh, communities using the digital technologies and digital content. And that has been very fascinating to see uh, those kids uh, going through this uh, education system. Traditionally, they did not have access to it because lack of resources, lack of proper training, lack of good uh, teachers. And what we have seen, technology, digital technologies actually help them to overcome uh, some of those challenges. So that has been there. So, these are the formal education after the informal one, also the formal education and the digital technologies. But then, next slide, please. It's uh, beyond the traditional system. Uh, what is also very important to look into is uh, this, uh, what's happening uh, right now and what's the future of it. And also from the School of Future of Innovation, it always excites us to look into uh, what are the trends that's upcoming. Uh, and as we, as we see and as we believe the future is for everyone, what we are looking into here is the AI, augmented reality, virtual reality. These are some of the things that has been uh, uh, actually already there. And uh, these, we are, these are going to be really big factors, really big players when it comes to design and management of educational content. And AI is not going to be just integrated as uh, topics for computer science or topics for engineering, but AI as a tool, as an interface of like a background uh, will be uh, integrated with regular education for the schools uh, in, in different levels. Uh, for example, in China, they're, they're testing this with an AI tutor or AI education management system where there's no uh, traditional uh, uh, teaching management, uh, um, you know, uh, organization. There are 
different classes the students can take and then there are AI tutored uh, like uh, advisors who can help them uh, with the education system. So it's, it's a cutting edge thing that we have been looking into. But also these augmented realities, virtual reality and machine learning or, or AI helps uh, to uh, ensure peer learning. So the gamification of education uh, and uh, a couple of the questions we have seen before uh, from, from you, from our participants, uh, have asked about gamification of education. And this is one of those things that uh, can, be, can be done with uh, the uh, actual use, effective use of AI, augmented reality and virtual reality. And this is not a science fiction and we have been seeing it uh, for quite some time. And this definitely is coming big uh, all over the world. Marian, is it? Yeah, so um, I want to make, I think, just two main points here. The, well, the first point has to do with the fact that, yes, we have, um, you know, universities have full, fully online degree programs. We've been involved in this for a long time. And then the second point um, just offers, um, again, most of you are probably familiar with these. The first would be considered communication devices, followed by, um, you know, free education and courses um, that are out there if you have internet access. And then finally, learning management systems um, are the final Moodle, Google, Canvas, Blackboard is another big one. Um, but there's two pedagogical points I really want to make. And I know we're getting close on time because we want to take, take more questions. And one has to do, somebody asked about um, learners with disabilities. And one thing that ASU has been working on for a long time now, and now has assistive technologies, is the idea of universal design. So when we design our um, our online programs, we, we should be designing them with, um, with everybody in mind, right? So people who have, um, who have hearing impairment, who have sight impairment. Um, and so we actually have a new, a new technology um, called Ally, um, and it tells us in our online course if something isn't visible or if something doesn't make sense if you can't see it. So there needs to be an audio component. Um, so these are things that are being developed and, and very important. Um, the other thing is, Online education has um, significantly impacted, uh, impacted learning pedagogy. And there, I, I noticed it was a question about curriculum design. Um, it shifted to what we call a more learner-centered approach. And this has been something in higher education in the United States um, and secondary and primary um, has been a focus of pedagogical change where instead of what we call the sage on the stage, the professor that stands and talks for an hour and everyone listens, um, which some of us still enjoy that, um, but the idea that learners become more active in their own education and what we've seen is that with online fully online education It's really a necessity. So the professor or the teacher and this is at any level becomes more of the facilitator of education rather than the, the, the purveyor of knowledge right students construct their own knowledge. Um, yeah, next slide. And this will be Fahim, and then yeah, that's followed so, by just sharing a little bit from ASU. Yeah. Right, right, right. So this is uh, this is on the top um, left of my screen, um, the screen that we are seeing. That's our life right now. That's how we are now uh, working on classes. Um, and the middle middle uh, picture uh, the, is actually life of my son, who is a seven year old. Uh, how he is uh, getting his education, or he actually. Uh, makes wants us to believe that he's getting education and then uh, the third one is that's how that's our challenge of we need to make sure that the education is entertaining enough that we have our students in front of the screen and it's happening because we have been pushed to digitize these things and uh, whatever the things that we have been talking about whatever the things the online education that Mary Jane was talking about just before um, these were with uh, we, we we have it in mind that it geolo uh, geolocation wise will be a bit static we are going to be delivering things in a certain ways and people are usually not under duress but now what's happening we're kind of pushed towards being uh, digitized uh, because uh, we cannot go out we cannot congregate uh, uh, socially and that actually uh, forced us to uh, come up with these, uh, these uh, different solutions. Some of them are working fine. Some of the platforms are breaking down uh, and uh, we are seeing some new innovations coming out. Uh, but at the same time, it actually, it also recognizes that these are resource uh, uh, heavy uh, solutions. 
where we are looking into high-speed internet. We are looking for uh, cost uh, to be taken care of. We are looking for content that are ready and the teachers uh, are the trainers that are ready to deliver those contents. But of course, as we know, that uh, the, out there in the field, uh, in the world, things are not like that. There are many challenges and we will talk about it right after Merijan talks uh, very briefly about ASU, what ASU is offering in this present crisis. Yeah, and the main thing here is not to um, tout our university, even though we like it very much, um, it's to share free resources with all of you. Um, and so if you go to this website, asu for you, um, Dot asu edu and again it's in the final resource slide um, you're going to find all kinds of things and i've only done a preliminary search of it but there's free online tutoring and lessons um, for um, uh, professors and also um, teachers um, and it looks like there's a focus on um, in the u.s sort of seventh grade to twelfth grade but there may be primary school um, so for you know, sort of ages 12 to 18, something like that, but there may be for younger students as well. Um, this is being developed as we speak. It just got rolled out about two weeks ago and it's ASU's effort to um, address the fact that we have, um, we have digital divides, we have um, differences in education um, access right here in Arizona and in the United States as well as across the world. Um, there's virtual field trips, so if you have, you know, if you have access, good access to the internet, you can go to the bottom of the Grand Canyon with one of our geologists. You can you can look into the into the cosmos um, with with some of our professors and researchers, and it's all completely free. There's also an ESL um, program where you can take um, English as a second language classes. Um, and again, lots of teaching resources. So it's, it's, it's free if you have internet access. So thank you. Unfortunately, in many places uh, that we look into, uh, do not have a good internet access. And even though we do have internet access, then there's a huge issue with cost. And then also, uh, if we are putting our students, uh, we are enforcing them to be at home, then not just internet access at the school, we are also expecting the internet access to have it uh, at home and then uh, to have the facilitation with the parents. Sometimes it, it, these are whole, like a lot of challenges uh, that we are facing. So what the trends we are seeing right now, and uh, for, as, as I mentioned before, I've been working with the uh, people who are displaced. So uh, when uh, you are designing things or when you are providing things uh, uh, of, education using different technologies where people are on the run, people are on the duress, you, you need to consider a different sort of uh, uh, bits and pieces, how you actually can have hybrid solutions. So we need to have multi-platform approaches uh, beyond just uh, having, so there are different uh, set of um, uh, secure platforms, formal platforms that we can use. But uh, in, in, in the cases that we, we don't have resources or the time to do those, then whatever the existing uh, possibilities we have, whatever the social network that we look into, we don't want to actually highlight one social network over the other. But for example, if uh, you are looking for, uh, you can do Facebook Live, and then it can be backed up with your SMSs or uh, the social media messengers. And then at the same time, what we are also looking into is the offline online approach of, uh, uh, there's a traditional broadcasting of uh, classes through uh, uh, the national broadcasters and in different parts of the countries or different parts of the world. And then you also have the papers, the newspapers who are uh, providing uh, education content. And then you are also backing it up with social media groups, Facebook groups and whatnot to make sure that you have the interactions ready. It's important that our pedagogy is also evolved around these uh, 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 applications, around these platforms, when you are we are delivering or designing education uh, under any crisis. Uh, we need to focus on the learning goals, the learning outcomes more than uh, just uh, the, the grades or the numbers or the GPAs. That's very much interesting to look into. And also it's important to see the value of uh, uh, radio the value of uh, TV, uh, the value of community uh, FM, and how it can be uh, have handshakes with internet, with Twitters, uh, with other social media, uh, and also some non-conventional ones, uh, the TikTok, Emo. People are using it, as, as we are talking about, uh, to provide education through entertainment, through some sort of a, a way so that we are uh, kind of, can be in the screen, we can have our attention to the screen, that's important. And AI, in many cases, are being used 
Uh, for example, as China was shut down, those AI has been used to, uh, to provide education for, uh, for the kids uh, at home. But not only that country, South Korea is also using it and some other countries. So there are some specific uh, examples to it. So we have another poll, the last one, I guess. Actually, we just, we just made an executive decision for him. We're going to skip it so you guys can go to the question and answer period. Perfect. Yeah, so I would so, just say we, we've tried. Um, thank you, all of you who, who sent questions in beforehand. And we, we read them all. And we tried to incorporate some of that into the presentation. So hopefully we've addressed some. And we have so little time left, but we've, you know, we really want to um, give you a chance to ask some questions. So Professor Parmentier and, and Hussein, thank you so much. Uh, we had great attendance on the webinar and most people stayed until the end. And I noticed that several or both of you actually were able to answer some of the questions on the fly. Great activity in the chat. Um, let me go to one that I saw earlier from Maria. Uh, she, and this was a theme of, of several people. Are there any strategies to make sure that uh, those with disabilities are not further left behind, those specifically deaf, blind, et cetera? Yeah, I think I already mentioned those with um, what we're doing at ASU. There is a program called ALLY, A-L-L-Y, and at Arizona State University, our, um, our IT specialists have integrated that into all of our classes. Um, and there's probably a lot more out there that is to um, assist people who are um, hearing or visually impaired who are taking online classes. And there's probably a lot more than that that I'm not even aware of. Terrific. We had a question from someone, I'm sorry, I didn't get your name. They said they work uh, with teachers who are often over 40 years old and they might not be very tech savvy. Do you have any suggestions or recommendations in that situation? Um, I think it's very important to um, design the things uh, with them um, who are uh, not tech savvy. And uh, in many cases, what we can do is also include the learners uh, to some extent in designing things. Uh, and that, and, and there can be best teachers. Uh, just yesterday, my son was teaching me how to play an online game uh, and he is six years old. So I think it's important that uh, these, uh, the when we are designing things and they also feel empowered if, if we include students in the conversation and student in designing the content rather than having a top down approach. Yes, and thank you. I'm noticing, I'm seeing some of the chats scroll by and, and some of you are offering um, resources to each other. So thank you for that. Um, and I would also, as a, as a learner um, of technology over 40, um, I would say that, you know, it is a challenge, but I know for myself, it really helps if people sit down with me um, and give me the skills that I need and um, give me the time that I need um, and not make me feel, you know, incapable, if that makes sense. So we're not gonna be able to get to every question. Mary Jane, there was one specifically, we have a minute or two left about solar spell and its accessibility with, again, with disabled, deaf, blind. Can you speak to that or does that need to be referred to someone? Yeah, I think that should probably re be referred to the solar spell team. Um, I'm sure that they're working on that because again, they've been working in refugee camps in many parts of the world. But again, Dr. Laura Hossman is the faculty director of that program. And the, at the end on the resource page, there is the website and you can get in contact. There was a lot of very good interest in the solar spell. So thank you for demonstrating that or showing it. Uh, maybe the last question here as we are at the top of the hour, what are the current pedagogical limitations for online delivered learning? Thank you, Sheris, for submitting that question. That's a really good question, and I, I want to hear what Fahim's going to say, but just really quick, I find that I struggle between synchronous and asynchronous. So um, when I teach my online courses, they tend to be asynchronous because I have students from around the world, and I find scheduling um, challenging, and now I've shifted to um, a face-to-face -face class, which is synchronous. And I suddenly find myself, uh, that's a different kind of pedagogy, right? That's different to, to teach in real time using technology versus, um, you know, not in real time. So what does Fahim have to say? Um, what's the question? What was the question? The pedagogical limitations for online education. Oh, um, uh, the pedagogical uh, limitations, I think, and that to some extent maybe uh, can be overcome if we uh, largely can use uh, augmented reality or virtual reality. Um, the face-to-face, -face, uh, conversation or the, you know, uh, those uh, uh, 
interactions of uh, the real uh, real time things uh, sometimes i personally miss that and i want i over i try to overcome it with uh, small videos uh, or small audio notes uh, that i have for my students not just for assignment based just to say hi or just to have some sort of conversations i know this cannot uh, recreate uh, the conversations that we can have in the class in 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 person but definitely technology at least can help us so this, uh, the 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 balance between synchronous and asynchronous that 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 can be done yes some very nice compliments in the chat box for our two professors from Arizona State Mary Jane Parmentier and Professor Fahim Hussein thank you to everyone who attended there will be a recording of this available on the RTAC website um, and we will be in communication um, to to provide access to that let me just note again that there will be an evaluation at the end of this. We hope you take a moment to do that. And Leslie, is there a final slide? There is. There's this one. I don't know if Mary Jane wants to go through it or we just let people look at it. And then we also have the resources slide. Yeah, I think everybody can read the final slide. I think we would all like to say thank you so much for spending these, this past hour with us. We've just scratched the surface and there's a lot of, um, a, a lot of knowledge out there. Um, that we can share with each other, especially during this time of the global pandemic. And we hope that you all take care and stay well. Thank you so much. Thank you so much. It's, uh, we can talk for hours and we can also listen for hours from you guys, but unfortunately we won't be able to do it. But let, reach out to us if you have any questions. We, we, I think our communications are there, details are there, and we'd love to hear. There are some fascinating questions I wish we had time to talk about. I know some of the people, I guess, so I'll reach out to them. Thanks again, professors, and thanks to everyone who attended. Uh, we will see you again on another webinar. And thanks to USAID and to NORC at the University of Chicago as well. Thanks, all. Thanks, everybody. Bye.